Hello there, podcast listener, and welcome to What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends discuss the movies that make us count until we hear the thunder, communicate with the other side, and rip our own faces off in a panic. Nice. My name is Matt. This is Christopher. I'm Amanda. And I'm Allison. Today's film is 1982's Poltergeist, directed by Toby Hooper and produced by Steven Spielberg. Now, before we get into it, I have a few fun facts, like I usually do for everybody. So this movie started as an idea that Spielberg had for another film called Night Skies, which would have been about a family terrorized by aliens. He had circled Toby Hooper as the director, and he had enlisted Rick Baker to oversee the creature effects. Eventually, the idea splintered off into two different ideas that would be made, Poltergeist and E.T., the extraterrestrial. Speaking of E.T., this was produced at pretty much the same time and locations as E.T., and it's part of why Spielberg couldn't serve as a director for this one. There was supposedly an impending director's strike in Hollywood and then rules within the director's union that said that he wouldn't be able to direct both films. Spielberg wanted to write the movie with Stephen King. Mm -hmm. However, a miscommunication and unavailability is credited as the reason that it didn't come to fruition. King said, It didn't work out because it was before the internet and we had a communication breakdown. I was on a ship going across the Atlantic to England. <laughs> it took him so long to reply to Stephen's telegram that he eventually just had to move on and find somebody else. It was released June 4th, 1982 in theaters, and E.T. followed the next week, which is wild. And so people called it the Summer of Spielberg. It opened against Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, which absolutely destroyed it at the box office. And it was just behind Rocky Three, which was number two of the box office that weekend. <laughs> it spawned two sequels and a supposed curse related to the franchise, credited to a whole variety of things, but namely the real skeletons used in the pool scene near the end of the movie. We, we'll get into that a little bit more later. There is only one real death in the movie. Uh, it is Carol Ann's bird, Tweety. And then for for you guys, but also for anybody who's listening, some additional listening that I think is fun and worth your time. There's a podcast called I Was There Too, which um, the setup of that is it's a podcast host and comedian named Matt Gorley who talks to people that had parts in really big movies, like kind of smaller parts. Uh, he talks to Martin Casella, who plays Marty, the mm -hmm. guy who rips his face off. Oh. Um, there, so that Marty Casella was Spielberg's assistant for like three years, starting with Raiders and I think ending after E.T. Um, no, it might have gone a little bit longer than that. Anyway, it's a really interesting listen, and there's a lot of fun stories about Poltergeist in that. So before we get into the deep dive, I want to know, what is everybody's experience with this movie? Well, I did not see this originally when it was out in the theaters. And by the way, I really miss those days of a blockbuster opening weekend where you've got three or four or however many movies to pick from. That seems like a kind of a golden era. It doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. No, Not no. in the same way, at least. No. So I didn't see this. I must have seen the TV ad, and I'm sure it scared me a lot. At some point later on, I saw it. And this is probably the third time that I've seen it in my life. Cool. Well, I've seen this movie a lot. The I was six years old when this movie came out. I did not see it at the theater, but I did see E.T. at the theater that summer with my oh. family. Yeah, I, have, I remember that one. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember the first time I saw Poltergeist, and I tried to ask my mom, who has a great memory, and she didn't remember when we first watched it, but it would have been in our basement, like, as a family for some reason. Um, I love this movie. I've seen it so many times and I just think it has a lot of heart to it and I'm really happy to revisit it today to pick it apart a little bit. Yeah, I did not see this in theaters because I was negative 10. <laughs> um, but I also don't have like a firm memory of seeing this for the first time, but I know that I saw it like as a child, so probably middle school. And I love this movie and I've seen it so many times. Um, but last year I made my husband watch it because it's not too spooky for him. <laughs> Although I did have to cover his eyes at one part. Um, but we had Shake Shack. And so now whenever oh. I think of this movie, I think of those like stuffed cheese, mushroom burgers and cheese fries every single time. It's just like these two things are married in my brain for the rest of my life now. <laughs> That's a good association. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I definitely saw this movie young. I also was not alive when it came out, so I didn't <laughs> see it in theaters. But I know that I saw it young um, and probably too young because I distinctly remember the scene in the bathroom. Well, I guess it's not really a bathroom because I think it's a slop sink where he's ripping his face off. Mm-hmm. Um, I also had a memory of it being a bathroom. And yeah. I have in my notes, like, this is clearly not. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> and like, but I also had like weird memories of the, of this taking, like having an Indian burial ground be a part part of it and yes i realize now that i'm conflating it which is really unfair because two sucks Um, (laughs) i like parts of it i like the creatures in two if you want to see the worst movie ever made watch poltergeist (laughs) three i i watched clips from it in my like lead up to this and uh it looks pretty bad Entirely pointless to watch it. Just, yeah, I watched. It takes place in like a high rise or in something in Chicago. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, Tom Skerritt couldn't even save it. I watched that one for oh, the. Oh, he's in it. Mm-hmm. He's, yeah, he plays the uncle. the uncle, friend of the podcast, and, Tom Skerritt. Um, <laughs> Lara Flynn Boyle from Twin Peaks plays the cousin in it. Uh, so that movie came out in '87. I did not see that one. Yeah. I saw part three for the first time within like the past four years. Yeah. I think I was just watching all of them in a row, and which was kind of fun to do and. I mean, I'm glad I watched it. It is really sad because the actress who played Carol Ann, Heather O'Rourke, she died before the movie was done filming. So there's yeah. like somebody else like using a body double at the end of the filming, which was weird. Yeah. And then it came out after she died. Um, but yeah, you don't need to watch Poltergeist 3. No, <laughs> no, that's that's my understanding. <laughs> Just Two watch is, part one 90 times. Two is OK if you haven't seen Poltergeist, the first one recently, and if you can overlook the extreme racism <laughs> yeah yeah there two has a lot of problems i saw it within the last couple of years and um the the guy the old guy like so i knew him before i saw that movie because his likeness appears on the cover of an anthrax album <laughs> that i really like oh my and gosh. so i when i saw the clip of me you're gonna die or whatever the hell it is <laughs> yeah. that he says in there i I figured, oh, well, if they used it, this is one of my favorite albums. Maybe this is a good movie. Mm-hmm. It's not no. really. He was effectively creepy, though, as yeah. like an older creepy man, Kane. Well, like, I would have watched that like as a kid, like yeah. being like 10 or 11 years old. And he was he had a good creepy vibe going on. He's, yeah. and like, Don't take butterscotch candies from him. No. And isn't it true, though, that he was like in the very last yes. stages of stomach cancer or he something? He died like right after that movie. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Um, yeah, and and so people are like, oh, it's part of the poltergeist curse, which is like, I don't know. I, if anything bad ever happens to a single person ever vaguely tangentially related, it's the curse. It's the well, him and curse. the shaman, were they both died of natural causes that are not supposedly related to the supposed curse. Right. It's the poltergeist it's curse. It's the poltergeist curse. Oh, fuck. <laughs> the remake. <laughs> yeah, did anyone watch the remake? No. I couldn't bring myself to. I started, I got about 15 minutes in, and it was just, man, I did not like it. I was bored. I It was making me really mad mm-hmm. watching it, and I just had to turn it off. Oh, man. It, I did watch it maybe, I don't know, seven, maybe it was shortly after it came out and we had it here at the library. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, because Poltergeist is such a great movie, and I knew that whatever they tried to remake it, and I am firmly, I don't like remakes of things that, are good. that I cherish <laughs> yeah. from younger days. Yeah. Um, and it was, no, it was stupid. It was pointless. There's no reason they should have remade it. Uh, and it was focused way too much on the clown, which was a cool little thing in the first one. But it's just a little thing in the first yeah. one. Exactly. Really. Exactly. You know? exactly. So just skip it. <sighs> yeah. I I don't know. I'm generally not in favor of remakes. And like you said, especially if it's something that's like, this is a mm-hmm. pretty beloved movie. Mm-hmm. Except by Siskel and Ebert. Mm-hmm. I, watched I think them. one of them liked it, one of them didn't. One of them really didn't, and the other one... One gave it three out of four, one gave it one and a half one out of four. Half. Yeah, that was uh, Siskel, I think, Siskel I think didn't one that, like that it. liked it. I but just the, read that thing this morning, that's why it's in my brain. <laughs> I watched that, and then the related video that I watched was their review of Aliens, where they both thought they both didn't like it, so, so <laughs> screw you guys. <laughs> I always get them confused with the... Um, Two like hecklers from uh, <laughs> the, Muppets? the Muppets. Yeah, that's like always who I imagine. Waldorf and Statler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Love those Thanks, guys. Allison. <laughs> Love those guys. All right. Well, are we ready to take it section by section here? We are. All right. The Star Spangled Banner plays over a blurry, extreme close-up of a television before switching off to static and pulls back to show us a rich slice of Americana. 
a golden retriever and gives us a tour of the Freeling home, which is adorable. Mm -hmm. Steve Freeling, played by Craig T. Nelson, is a successful real estate agent who works for a large housing development firm. Steve lives in one of these developments with his wife, Diane, played by Joe Beth Williams, and their three children, Dana, played by Dominique Dunn, Robbie, by Oliver Robbins, and Carol Ann, played by Heather O'Rourke. Strange events begin to occur when Carol Ann is awakened by a noise downstairs. She tiptoes down into the living room and proceeds to have a seemingly one-sided conversation with a TV set that's turned on but has no signal. Her spooky conversation is loud enough that it wakes her parents. The next morning, we're shown sprawling rows of angular homes, called the sacks full of kids on bikes and also bumbling adults on bikes carrying beers over to watch the game <laughs> with the other dads, all taking place in the idyllic Cuesta Verde neighborhood. Diane discovers Carol Ann's pet bird, Tweety, dead in its cage, and then the family conducts a small burial service. <laughs> Later on that night, Robbie learns a thing or two about thunder and lightning, Carol Ann awakes again and talks to the television, and a spectral manifestation erupts from the television screen and enters the wall, causing a violent tremor. As the family wakes up, Carol Ann announces, They're here. <laughs> well, there's so much in this opening. Um, I think one thing that I have to remember is that so many things that we've seen a million times must have really been new back then. Mm -hmm. Like this whole white noise thing in the TV. I don't remember another movie doing it before Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. um, and I got thinking about playing the Star Spangled Banner. To me, that's a real kind of anti-American opening. That That's how I read it I anyway. I think so too. Right. Yes. Like good old America, just, you know, cemetery. Well, because it plays we'll on the TV away. again later. Mm -hmm. well, There's you, another scene when they're sleeping and that song's on. Do you guys remember when TV stations used to do that sign-off? Oh, God, yeah. What? So, no. So, <laughs> the Star Spangled Banner baby. as a sign-off song? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that at all. So I have a whole article pulled up. What? And I can even play you Detroit's example. Because oh. I remember this from when I was a kid, because I was a bad kid, and I stayed up late watching TV. And depending on what channel you were watching, so like, like channels four, seven, and two, like Fox, NBC, and mm -hmm. ABC now, like their local affiliates, WDIV, ABC, and I don't remember what. Anyway, so at a certain point when programming would be finished, this is long before like 24 2 hour television. Well, it would depend because sometimes it would be midnight, sometimes it'd be one, two, depending on if there was like a Saturday night movie, it would run a little bit later. They would have a sign off. So they go through and they talk about the frequency that they're broadcasting at and all this stuff, which is required by the FCC. And then they would play a different variation of the Star Spangled Banner with all this strange imagery underneath it. Because they were like war images, like the Lincoln Memorial. Well, and so every market had their own version of it. And, and then by the time it would end, it would switch to static or color bars and like a consistent bars frequency. and tone and so it did that for years and years i think they stopped doing that in the 90s like in the late 90s um that tracks yeah but so. man when the, when the tv goes off and it would just be suddenly static i remember being a kid and thinking this is kind of freaky Aww. yeah it's for sure. kind of disturbing yeah it's like there were people there talking and now it's just this weird void so i, I think this is such a great opening for well, this I movie. I think, too, like as a kid, when we would like, you'd go up to the TV and turn the dial, and some of the stations were just fuzz because there wasn't anything there. You had to keep turning the dial until you found it. So I don't remember being, even after this movie, I don't remember being like frightened of it or that it noticeable. It was just like annoying that you couldn't get the station or. Like now it's so easy to just flip through and every station's a station, yeah. whereas as a kid, you had to like find the right button. Yeah, I don't think that you encounter static on digital cable, like not that's really, right. you know. Of course, that's or at the end gone. of a VCR tape, yeah, you know, or a beginning of it, you know, before when it before it like uh, queues up. Yeah, I love that. I yeah. really, I feel so nostalgia and, and like giddy right now thinking yeah, about fuzz. This this movie in general for me is very nostalgic because it's mm -hmm. just like I. The reason I picked this movie is because it fits very squarely in that era of, like, the horror movies that I watched when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And that I still, like, this whole opening section, everything before she says they're here, is just, like, it's what I want every movie to look mm -hmm. like. It's what Stranger Things wants to be. Mm -hmm. It's what, it's what 
anything that's supposed to look like it's from the 80s or from the 70s. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just the perfect distillation of it. And you can really feel the Spielberg of it all. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird because you can and you can't. Like, it's not quite like 100%, but it's like 85% it's Spielberg. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Toby has the correct numbers. I really love the opening of this. I love how the way we get to meet each family member is through the dog traipsing through the house looking for snacks and chips. Rocks. That was really adorable. <laughs> it's also very effective. Yep. You get introduced to their house, the layout, and where everybody sleeps. And you meet everybody. Yeah. And like every room that becomes really important for a different reason later, we get like our first glimpse of it. And there's all kinds of like extra ephemera around the house, like the Star Wars posters, the alien posters, all mm-hmm. the toys and... See, I even think that the family in Poltergeist is similar to the family in Jaws. They have oh. such a central role, and all the characters have such a central role, and it just, the both families seem very Spielbergian to me. Mm-hmm. For sure. I was surprised by how quickly it starts. Like, I feel like most movies, there's like a 20-minute preamble of, here's the house, and here are the people, and mm-hmm. these are like what they, this, it's like, Here's the kid, and the kid is talking to the TV immediately. Mm-hmm. Like yep. within so five wild. minutes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then even the stuff that shows the the neighborhood, all that fun Americana stuff, mm-hmm. is like, it's pretty quick. It just it flies by in five minutes. It's, and the editing is so good. Yeah, and it's a two hour movie, but the pacing is fantastic. And mm-hmm. you, the first five minutes, you are introduced to all the people, and then the next morning you get the neighborhood. It's you know where you are, who is there, and it. It's so good. It's really well done. It does have that Jaws jaunty music in it, though, right <laughs> at the beginning. I'm like, oh my god, that so takes me out of a horror oh, setting. Oh, really, man? See, I love it. See, it's it's to me, it's like being somebody that is a dweeb who listens to scores. It's just like, ooh, it's a Jerry Goldsmith score over a, <laughs> over a Spielberg movie? What? Oh. Um, I I love the score in this movie. It it really it works very well for me. Great. <laughs> I like Carol Ann's theme that keeps yes. like replaying through the yep. entirety. I also think the beginning is super funny. There's so many little jokes. Oh yeah. I love that the dog is like stealing chips, and I love that that guy is like riding his bike, and the kids knock him over, and he like breaks his stick on the bicycle and spills all the beer. And that beer <laughs> is still spraying all over the place by the time he gets to the house to watch the game. Yeah. And then they have like the the impossible would never happen issue with the remote control, yeah. and like mm-hmm. they're all like, "Who's this guy looking at, Mister Rogers?" Yeah, who the hell is this? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to know who the fuck tries to flush a bird down the toilet. That would destroy my entire neighbor. <laughs> it would be bad. And, yeah. Um, I also love, related to the bird, I love that av- the seconds after they, yes! bury the, after they bury the bird, the dog is digging it right back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say Carol Ann's line where she's like, can I have a goldfish Oh, well, there is that. Yeah. There is that. Yeah. But, like, but the second that they pan back to show the whole family, the dog is digging the bird up right Oh, away. man. It, yeah, that bird also gets dug up by the backhoe or whatever yep. when they're the little cigar you can see box. the box. Yeah. 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 yeah, I like too when she's burying it. It's also a good introduction introduction for like death and something bad happening. It's sort of a premonition of things to come. Yep. because you're putting another casket in the yard, which is where, what they're living on. I never thought about. And that. I like how Carol Ann too. She's like got the licorice for when he's hungry, for when he's lonely. <laughs> yeah, that's just really precious. She's it's really cute. She's adorable. She's a pretty good little actress, too. Yeah. And surprisingly good. For sure. I had watched, um, I've seen all these before, but I watched two and then three and then one just because I was confident that I, I've seen this movie so many times. You wanted to reward yourself with something good at the end. <laughs> it was shocking how much better this movie is. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just So anyway, I was used to seeing Carol Ann a little bit older and watching her at this. Like, she is tiny. Yeah. She's mm-hmm. five years old. That's yeah. so wild. Yeah, and there, I was reading an article where Jo Beth Williams was commenting on how great of a kid actress she was, and that part of it was she, like, grabbed hold of Joe Heather O'Rourke ha- grabbed hold of Jo Beth Williams' hand and just kind of followed her around. And so, if like the mom was, you know, screaming, then the daughter would scream, or if she was crying, she would kind of take cues from her, and she just like did it like in a heartbeat, and it happened so quickly. Yeah, I just I think that's amazing because it could have been if she would have been. 
like a lesser actress, it would have been way different. But she was so like adorable. That Absolutely. shot of her like wearing the little jammies, like coming down the stairs, that is like iconic. And it's so cute. Yep. And you're like, oh no, what is she gonna do? I was also really impressed by the boy, who was also so tiny compared to yep. how he looks in the second movie. Yeah. But he's also an incredible actor. I really the whole family is just kind of perfect. I mm-hmm. I my personal favorite in this is Joe Beth Williams. I think I love her. she she gets some of the best moments in the movie and she also looks the most scared. Mm-hmm. But also Craig T. Nelson's anyway, I <laughs> He's such a good dad. He's so he's perfect. Before, yeah. After, before. Oh after. That, that whole veteran thing is yeah. so funny. And apparently like, that was improv. Yeah. Yeah. And like she's rolling up joints, he's reading a book about Reagan. Yeah. Yeah, so what year was this movie again? 82. 82. So that must have been shocking for audiences. Yeah. To see this couple smoking grass. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I thought you meant the Reagan book. I was oh, like, why? No. <laughs> no, they were probably fired up about that. But, yeah, um, I mean, that had to be an early, like, mainstream movie that showed anyone smoking pot yeah. and with no... Uh, bad consequences. Also, parents right. were like, doing it. Right. Like, there were teens who were seeing the movie and thinking, huh, parents, parents do are that? doing it down the hall. And not yeah. only that, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's in this scene where there's that little bit of dialogue where it's, like, revealed that she is his second wife. Mm-hmm. And like Carol Ann is their their like actual kid together. Oh, God, I totally and the boy. That. But Dana is oh, the from too. the first okay. marriage. Right. Right. Which makes sense and is better because otherwise the age difference between Dana and uh Joe Beth is a little Yeah. I didn't I, n- I didn't yeah. pick up on that. I, I, I've never picked up on that. Yeah, I I the f- I watched this three times for the podcast, <laughs> and the first time is the first time I picked up on that. Interesting. I, yeah, I was like, oh, I guess the mom was sixteen when she had Dana. <laughs> yeah, and she's she's like telling some she's telling some story about when she's younger um, that like reveals. I don't remember what the exact okay, phrase. Okay, I'm gonna is, go back. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I also like the parents' chemistry. Like they feel like actual people that we're sort of mm-hmm. like intruding on, as opposed to like, yep. hey, honey, when's dinner gonna be ready or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I feel mm-hmm. like that's one thing Spielberg does so well. Mm-hmm. You know, you get these insights into family, and it seems so real. Yeah. So before we move on to the next section, I, I want to go back to something you said, Allison, about how this feels like eighty-five percent Spielberg. Yes. So. How much have you guys dug into the like the conversation around who really directed this movie? I know a vague amount from, I don't like just being a big nerd. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. from any research I did for this. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just I've read several articles on it. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where like for and I was guilty of this for many years of of the assumption is like oh well Spielberg really directed this movie and. Um, not to say too much about that that um I was there too podcast because Martin Casella um pretty clearly spells out that it's like no Toby Hooper directed it mm-hmm. Spielberg is just a very hands-on producer and if anything it was like a really clear collaboration between the two of them and I want to pull this up this is not useful for the listener but listeners can go find this video on YouTube of the making of Poltergeist have you seen the hat that Spielberg was wearing on set that has two sides. One of them says director, one of them says producer. Uh. <laughs> I can't find any other information about this hat. Interesting. If you search for Spielberg poltergeist hat, producer, director, whatever, like there's no information, but if you watch the there's there's only a seven minute documentary about the making of this, which I think is criminal. There should be a two hour documentary about it. Yeah. And just without mentioning anything about it, there's a pic that he's wearing a two-sided hat in it. I think is very funny, and doesn't help the um, the uh, controversy around whether he directed it or not. Um, I think um, Zelda Rubenstein, who plays Tangina, she was like pretty harsh on Toby Hooper, mm-hmm. and she basically said yeah. that Spielberg would like line up the shot, and then Toby would. Um, Call the directions and yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I guess also Toby Hooper had a pretty serious drug problem at the time. So he was like not able to be present. It's true. Time. And I've, I've read all kinds of shit about this. And like the, all the accounts are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Spielberg, when he was there, being who he is and who he was back then at his peak powers, I think was just more involved than your average producer. So people assumed, well, he's directing. But Toby Hooper's dead and he can't defend himself. And, yeah. I, and I think that we should we should make it clear. 
he directed this movie, and Spielberg was a very close collaborator. <laughs> All right, are we ready to move on to the next segment? We are. All right, so the next morning, breakfast is fraught with weird chaos. Drinking glasses inexplicably break, and utensils bend by themselves. When Diane asks Carol Ann who she meant when she said, they're here, she answers, the TV people. At first, those TV people play harmless tricks and lightly spook the Freelings, doing things like moving and stacking the kitchen table chairs. Diane and Carol Ann also discover an area in the kitchen where an unseen force will seemingly pull anything, including people, across the floor. Later that night, during a terrible thunderstorm, the gnarled tree outside the kid's bedroom window suddenly comes to life and grabs Robbie out of his bed. This is merely a distraction used by the poltergeist in the house to get Carol Ann's parents to leave her by herself. While Steve rescues Robbie from the grips of their horrible tree, Carol Ann is pulled through her bedroom closet into another dimension. <laughs> the family believes that a tornado caused all the trouble until they realize that they can't find Carol Ann. They search the entire house and the recently dug up pool to no avail until Robbie hears Carol Ann calling for their mother eerily through the television. This golden retriever is trying so hard and is so good, trying to let them know, but they're all so dumb, they can't understand. Dogs always know. e is doing their best. Barking at that little spot on the wall, bringing the toy over. <laughs> what a great name, too. Yeah. 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 I, want an, I think it's E-Buzz. E-Buzz? Yes. I, I thought, thought it was like Eba. I thought it was Eva. No. I thought it was Eba. E-Buzz. E-Buzz. What? Yeah, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Electronic buzz? E buzz? Huh. <laughs> Sounds like a I don't know. I don't want to open Chrome because it might crash my computer again, but I but I'm very curious about that. <laughs> yes. Uh Gene Shallot on the TV yes. at Ho- breakfast. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Gene Shallot was a very famous uh television critic. Like he well, movie critic who was on TV. Mm-hmm. He has like a big goofy mustache and so when, when they're having breakfast and, like, the glasses break and stuff like that, he just happens to be on the TV at the time, which... Oh. Yeah. It must when Caroline was turning him. on the tiny TV. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. When she was flipping through channels, at one point you get Gene Shallot. It's definitely recognizable of the era. Yep. What I love when... Um, when dad comes home and mom is going to show him the trick and she sets it all up and it happens and then mom like jumps up and down yeah She's and then it cuts to Carol Ann and she yawns and wants pizza I just love that her and the daughter have been working on this like all afternoon the mom's excited she's all revved up and the kid's just like mom are we done yet I want pepperoni and the dad is like what? he's like no this is totally this, shocked he's yeah. like this can't be real this is not what, what's going on <laughs> so speaking of Pizza Hut do you know the story about the weird edit that happens there? Yes. No. So, so at that point, so there is a weird edit in that particular scene when um, when he's sitting up against the wall and he looks kind of shell shocked, like where they're talking. She's talking about like what the what the thing is doing, and then suddenly they're next door on the person's porch. So apparently in the script, I'd have to pull it up, but like. Um, Steve has some line about, I hate Pizza Hut. And um, Pizza Hut found out about this before the movie had officially released, and the studio had to go back and remove the line because Pizza Hut took such offense to them besmirching their name in the movie. Aww. When you go back and watch it again, watch for the... There's a really strange, like, yep. sudden jump, <laughs> and it's it was, the, it was the only way that they could cut around it. The highly respected and revered Pizza Hut name. <laughs> of course. Known for its very good pizza. And magicians at one point. And also free pizza Illusions. for reading books. Do you not Illusions, remember the magicians Dad. at Pizza Hut? No. Okay. The- <laughs> We're sending Allison way far into space right now. It's true. <laughs> so what's up with the mosquitoes? I think it's like a curse thing. I think it's that affecting was- them. They were, so when they were filming that scene, um, Stephen was like, hey, you know, we're outside, it's dust, there's probably going to be mosquitoes, so pretend you're swatting at mosquitoes. So when they were filming it on the neighbor's porch trying to ask them if there's anything weird going on, they start slapping, there's no mosquitoes, but but the, Stephen wanted them to appear like like there were real mosquitoes, so that's why it got a little slapsticky when they were slapping because they kind of got, it felt silly and funny to them, the actors. Yeah. Oh, so it was an actor's 
choice. It's just, yeah, no, it's a, they it's, were told to pretend there were mosquitoes buzzing to make yeah. the scene more real. Why? They seem high as fuck that entire uh, scene. I know. <laughs> like they're coming over for uh, a swingers ball or something. <laughs> I mean, and mosquitoes. I love that yeah. the neighbor is like, I've never been bitten by a mosquito in my life. <laughs> yes. Son, have you? Right. It's like, oh. He's eating a big plate of beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- that's, I like the neighbors. Yep. They're very funny. Um, also in this section we get there's the guy who is kind of like cat calling is not really the right thing because he just says I love you I love you I love you as he's hugging the rake you know who oh, that is the rake so or the shovel or whatever the hell it is so that's that's Sonny Landham who I also know from the movie Predator huh. um, where he's the he's like the the tracking expert in Predator hmm. um, what. But is it, he the guy that eats the chili too, or whatever? No, that's the, the, that's the other guy that that's called that she calls Bluto. Yeah, he like yeah. leans in and takes a spoonful of the chili out of the oh, pot. He's drinking the coffee out of the cup or whatever. The coffee, he eats some crackers, I think too, and yeah. Then she just shuts the blinds on him. Well, and then the daughter flips the, the one guy mm-hmm. off elaborately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and the mom and they all says love it girl. for some reason. They yeah. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even I love the mom, it. <laughs> classic eighties misogynistic garbage. Absolutely, but she responds well. It was, it's good. That's like her big moment in the entire movie. That in the line at the end. That in the very end. <sighs> Which is very good. There's a great line, too, when I think the mom says, you'll ruin your eyes. This is no good when mm-hmm. they're flipping around the TV mm-hmm. for breakfast mm-hmm. and they switch to a war scene. Yes. And that seems to be okay. <laughs> Carolyn <laughs> wants yeah. to right. watch the fuzz. Yeah. Right. The static on right. there. Yep. So in this, when uh, this section ends with Robbie at the TV, I think Robbie's acting in this was so good because he's yelling, Carolyn, Carolyn, he just got saved from the tree. He's covered in goo and blood. He looks disgusting. Mm-hmm. And he's in the bedroom, like staring at the TV, screaming while the mom and the dad are trying to find Carol Ann in the house. Yeah. Such a cool, creepy <laughs> scene. It all happens so quickly. The tree that yesterday his father told him was there to protect him yes. that clearly just tried to fucking kill him <laughs> and then disappeared into a like sucking vortex in the sky. Yeah. But you're right. That's honestly the freakiest moment to me is like the quality of his voice when mm-hmm. he's the screaming. Way he was saying it's really Carol Ann. First, I think he's is he yelling for his mom? He's yelling Carol Ann. Uh, he's trying to alert his mother. He's like, Carol Ann, Carol Ann, oh, Carol Ann. Yeah. 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 Like while well, he's like in front of the TV in their bedroom. It's good. It's so wild. It's so creepy. I don't understand how they filmed Carol Ann getting sucked into the closet. Like logistically, I don't understand how that works. I would have to assume some sort of strings or something like or wires pulling her towards it and maybe filming from a different perspective. Um, you know, because I know that, that like, did any of you watch the seven minute making of thing? Mm-mm. It's super brief, which is, again, it's a shame, but you can see that like they built this set on like a really big hydraulic setup thing, which is how they're able to accomplish the thing the towards gimbal? the end when the yeah, so it's like they're able to flip the house totally uh. up on its side, like different rooms of it at least. Um, so I'm guessing it has it was in some way like that, like with, you mean like when she's trying to hang mm-hmm. on to her bedpost? Yeah, yeah I, I'm assuming that it's tilted that. or something. Yeah. Unless there were some mega mega strong fans. I guess she was afraid of that, and so you can tell that there's a dummy in later parts of that because mm-hmm. she was so afraid that I guess Spielberg like took her in his arms and was like you don't have to do that again yeah well also I mean it was probably potentially unsafe for a small five-year-old to be doing whatever they're doing <laughs> yeah there were a few things that happened in this movie that were that were unsafe that Spielberg had to yeah. jump in and comfort people including like Joe Beth Williams in the mm-hmm. pool they yeah. had all the lighting rigging over it and she was like I don't want to get electrocuted so he got in the pool with her mm-hmm. he's like well if you go I go too <laughs> which is I don't know how the insurance company would feel. I also about that. like yeah. this. So this movie was originally rated R, yep. and then Stephen and Toby got them to change it to PG. This he is good old PG down, movie. Yeah, which is nuts to think mm-hmm. about. PG, like I everything was PG. That's yeah. why we watched it all in the yeah. 80s. <laughs> Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take that. Um, another thing that I love that happens in this section. Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, there's a there's a really fun little dissolve that happens between the the kitchen in their house and then the kitchen in the model home that he's showing. Oh, yeah. Um, that I, I think is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you think they just put, like, different wallpaper on it? Probably. 
I don't know. I don't know for sure how they did it, but I just but I love the way that it looks. It's yeah. just a it's just a fun little uh fun little thing. And then and then also in the in the kitchen, there's a line that Joe Beth William has that, that she says to Steve that says, Reach back into our past when you had an open mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really good. Um <laughs> Before before she shows him the little trick, <laughs> it is nice how she puts a helmet on Caroline before she sends her across before the floor. Before she allows a yeah. spirit to move her yeah. across the room. <laughs> um, also, if you like zoom out and look at this movie like from a farther perspective, it's so funny that Diane is so obsessed with the pool, which has nothing to do with anything the entire time but there's like five different pool scenes because she's like oh my god the swimming pool mm-hmm. and then she runs out there's nobody there yeah. yeah even at the end it's like there there's no point of going back there yeah she went out there to call for help at the end she's out the there neighbors. screaming for help, uh-huh. help yeah. and that's when she was in the backyard yelling over the fence and that's when she falls in i was surprised i know we're not there yet but i was so surprised that the neighbors are the one to pull her out i like didn't have a memory of that happening yeah because they're there for like a second, and then they immediately chicken out. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, they did their one part. They they're did their fine. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do think though, like in the '80s, when there was a huge boom of everybody installing like an underground pool. Like I lived in a, a cul-de-sac. Uh, we had a, we had a mere ranch compared to one of these colonial homes. But the people behind me had an underground pool, and the people to the left and right of us had a kayak pool. So installing pools was a big deal. And when we moved in in the late '70s. My mom was afraid because my brother was a baby and he was like, when he was like a toddler, he was like less than one when he was walking and she was terrified that he was, and my brother could scale a fence at a year old. She Mm -hmm. was afraid he was going to climb the fence and like wind up floating in the pool. Like that was an honest terror that my mom had because of the underground pool that was behind us. Yeah. Well, also I think drowning is like Mm -hmm. one of the top ways that children die and it happens all the time, even now. It does still. And I think it was a much bigger thing, especially back then. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of emphasis put early on, like about like, oh, well, we 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 dug that, mm-hmm. like when they when they're first looking for Carol Ann. Yeah, you know, they have like the horrifying realization of, oh my God, it might be in the pool, and then that's the first time that somebody's in that. Well, muddy, earlier, shady water. It, I think the pool. Of course, the workers are building it, but there's that scene with um, the mom and the dad in the bedroom when they're rolling when their joints or whatever. Yep, and. She was talking about telling stories of when she was younger and she was sleepwalking and she was saying, oh, Carol Ann, and she was worried about Carol Ann sleepwalking. And then it dawned on her, oh, wait, what if Carol Ann sleepwalks and lands in the pool? That is totally legitimate and that is exactly what she should be thinking. Sure, Mm -hmm. yeah. I also love that because um, in the second one, there's so much more emphasis on like how Carol Ann and the mom both have like powers and so does the grandma. I say, don't they come from grandma or something? Yeah. Yeah. It's like inherited through female... It's lady stuff. <laughs> you know, you guys wouldn't understand on that side of the table. <laughs> well, I was denied or blessed. <laughs> I've got it. Just kidding. Um, yeah. Uh, Robbie's about to be fucked up for the rest of his life. <laughs> oh, no shit. <laughs> Poor Robbie. Eaten by a tree for a minute, sort of. <laughs> and then when they cut to Steve, when he's talking to those people next... Yeah, yeah, yeah. His facial expression, holy shit. He looks like shit. It's he looks awesome. like he gained or aged ten years. He's got a little beard going. He's smoking. Yeah. He looks a wreck. All right. A traumatized Steve meets with the small group of parapsychologists from UC Irvine, stating that we just want you to find our little girl. Doctor Lesh, Ryan, and Marty are awestruck by the manifestations they witness. With the parapsychologist present, Steve opens the door to the children's room to reveal toys and other objects flying around by themselves and disembodied laughing voices reverberating throughout the room. (laughs) After they see the Freeling's house, they are all humbled. Over coffee, and a coffee urn that moves by itself, the parapsychologist explained to the Freelings the difference between a poltergeist and a haunting. They determine that indeed it is a poltergeist that they are experiencing. The group witnesses several paranormal episodes where they hear Carol Ann talking to Diane through the TV. They see spirits, and they hear the pounding footsteps of some terrible force, which subsequently injures Marty. After helping himself to both steak and chicken out of the Freeling's fridge, Marty also suffers a terrifying hallucination where he seems to tear off his own face. The parapsychologists leave, with the exception of Ryan, admitting that they need more help. Shaken and overwhelmed, Dana leaves to stay with friends. The Freelings also send Robbie and the dog to his grandmother's house for safety. 
the face ripping thing is the coolest thing in this movie, I mm-hmm. think. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you guys know the whole story with that, that it, those are Spielberg's hands ripping it. Oh, really? It. really? I didn't know that. No, yeah. I did not know either. So when they were setting up the makeup effect for it, like it was kind of elaborate, but they only had one dummy. They had to get it right the first time. Wow. And so apparently, like Marty had thrown out the idea, well, maybe Steven should do it. Because he know he kind of knows exactly what he wants, and so it's his hands, and they got it in the first take. Wow, nice. which is super cool. It's so gross. Yeah, it's oh, it's very gross. Watching it's, that as a kid, it's like holy smokes, and that's like that's like in the top horror moments of all time mm-hmm. on like any list you look at. That's a really great scene. It's definitely the thing that fucked me up the most from this movie. Oh yeah, I, I've since seen the like edited for TV version, which is very different. It's still pretty messed up. But it's not flesh ripping and falling into the sink and anyway, it's not quite as gross. It's it's like he it's like he just like melts basically. Gotcha. Um, mm-hmm. The way it's presented here, especially flipping between seeing his face and then seeing all the gross flesh falling like in blood falling mm-hmm. into the sink makes it so much worse. Like the quick cutting between the two yeah. and yeah. the sound of it, mm-hmm. yeah, the squishy. <sighs> yeah. So is the other guy the one that's having the steak and the chicken? The steak that's caught, they, where he hallucinates. That's him. It's the same guy. Okay. Marty, well, he yeah. and he hallucinates, but it gets all over yep. the steak. The chicken. So the steak, well, the steak, the steak, the steak cooks like itself on the counter. Open oh, yeah. And okay. He's it opens eating up. the chicken leg as he's getting ready to fry a steak out of someone else's <laughs> fridge. I also, he just reaches in the fridge, pulls out a whole yeah. steak. Like it's not in a wrapper it's just or anything. In there. Yeah. And he tosses that's just it on how the, the counter. That's how the house operates. Yeah. Yeah. You just take whatever food you can find. That's how things used yeah. to be. Chili, <laughs> coffee, They don't make them like chicken. that anymore. <laughs> Diane can burn in the kitchen. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So I know it's not supposed to be this ultra. Horror, horror movie. But as soon as you bring in an investigative team of a team of ghost hunters, you've really lost me as far as horror goes. <laughs> because now you've got someone to appeal to, someone who believes you, someone you can hope will solve the problem for you. And this is true for what is it? Uh, Conjuring. Don't they have a horror team in that? Insidious. Insidious. The Insidious yeah. movies, which are basically remakes of this movie. Exactly. Hmm. And so, as soon as you've got someone who believes you, then you've you start to take some of the horror away. And I know this isn't supposed to be this ultra horrific movie either, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it does. It's like now you've got people working with you, and I'm I've lost my fright. Sure. For here. But you also don't know, even though they n- know it's real, they believe them, There's also it's also a threat. Mm-hmm. It's also, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to solve whatever the problem is. Right, it does. I found it <laughs> so funny that um, that guy is like so proud. He's like, I took video of a seven hour time lapse of this <laughs> yeah. thing moving seven feet. And right. Steve opens the door to like the craziest shit you've ever he's seen in right. your life. And, and when he's saying that, Craig T. Nelson is just kind of going, uh-huh. Yeah, like yeah. He's, it, it's like he's playing it so perfectly right there. Well, even the whole time that the the investigators are at the house, and it has become so commonplace for that family. They're used to it. I don't know how much time has actually passed, but they're they're either. used to it. Like even like the light that blinks, like the woman's hands are visibly shaky as she's trying to like drink the coffee <laughs> from the coffee urn, and the light blinks one time, and then the mom's like, "Oh, it's gonna blink again." They come in pairs. Yeah. Like it's just so like yeah. nonchalant, and so I love that Stephen's role is the same, where it's just like, "Oh no." Yeah. He's like, "We don't go in there. We don't go in there." The and he's just like rolling his eyes. Dana seems deeply affected mm-hmm. by all of it. When Diane is communicating with her and she has like, oh, she went through me thing. And it's like kind of an emotional thing. Like they cut to Dana a couple of times. And I really noticed that the last time I watched it, she's freaking out. Yes. She is having a terrible time on the couch. Probably good, though. I feel like she'll be the most normal of all the kids after this. <laughs> For sure. I will say that Dana's I, her re- responses to everything going on. I find her annoying in this movie. I don't like the way she's acting it. The way she just kind of like sure. freaks out, or I yeah. like the scene around the breakfast table with the younger siblings. But the time she's supposed to be freaking out, like even when she comes back later towards the end of the movie, for some reason she's just like dead on the screen to me. Like it doesn't. I don't think she. I don't know why we need her. That's fair. I mean, we don't get her very much. We have, yeah. they they literally just jettison her at some point. Like that, eh, mm-hmm. go somewhere else. 
Well, yeah. I don't know. Anyways, so like I think Robbie and Carolyn do a better job um, as characters, like responding. Of course, they're they're young, way younger than mm-hmm. the sixteen year old. Yeah. Well, that also works in their favor because they are innocent and they are also helpless. Whereas a teenager, I'm like, mm, you're basically an adult. So yeah, like, she would have some agency. <laughs> She'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, go to your friend's house. It's yeah. gonna be fine. Um, favorite scene in the entire movie: Hulk riding by on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After like a compass spins around in front of him, yeah, just yeah. to play music on the record that's flying around. That's right, yeah, <laughs> God, yeah. And it looks like it looks so hokey now, but I still love it. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's classic early ILM stuff. Do you guys know about the? There's a pretty famous deleted scene from this. It, it doesn't exist in a way that you can see it. Oh man! But so. When Marty goes upstairs and then he comes back, he's like, hey, something bit me. And he shows the bite marks on yeah. him. And Robbie goes, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which is not the right reaction. No. So apparently they filmed a whole scene of the oh, bees really? biting him. And oh. they went to the whole trouble of like, they, they rigged him up. They put squibs all over him, which squibs are like blood packs usually um, that explode. The deal with it was because it was a ghost that was biting him, They the squibs were not blood packs. They had, like, dish detergent in them because it was supposed to look like ectoplasm. Mm. And so what ended up happening is at the end of the scene, everybody on the set, including Marty, started laughing because it looked like semen. Uh, oh, my God. Um, wow. they, they went to all this trouble, and apparently he, ha- like, he has these stills that were sent to him by Spielberg of the scene, but I don't think that it ever. I don't think it's ever mm-hmm. been like fully produced in in a oh, finished man. interesting process. But yeah, I. But they they decided to cut it from the movie because the emotional weight of the scene of Diane was too good that if they cut away to this guy being bit by a ghost, yeah. they thought it would be like, <laughs> well, that might not really. It work. would have broken it because that is yeah. a really pretty long, intense scene about Diane and meeting yeah. with the investigator and. Yeah. That whole scene is good. We also, this is also in those conversations with um, Diane and Steven talking about what was happening. We learned that Caroline was born in the house. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that kind of adds a little weight to the. And um, Diane and Robbie talk with one of the investigators here. And Robbie asks if he can get killed so he can show Carol Ann how to get back. Mm. Ah. Yep. And he mentions tying a rope around his waist, which is ultimately what they end up doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So go Robbie. He's yeah. got some problem solving skills. <laughs> I don't know, just throw her in there. PG movie. Yeah, I yeah. was just gonna yeah. say this movie is PG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I really like from this section is I think that the the like ghosts coming down the stairs thing looks very fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Um I miss like light water tank effects like that they mm-hmm. just i just i wish more movies did stuff like that now and they're like little balls of light but you can also see humans and like hats and it's very slow yeah. and like with the music it's just really it's creepy it's and like good. and like what it looks like from like our perspective versus what it looks like on the captured thing is different too mm-hmm. it's really it's just really neat mm-hmm. i don't know that it's oh, good ghost stuff for the paranormal yes um that also really i'm not going to talk about the second movie all the for the entire podcast, but um, those people are like part of the plot in the second one. Yes, and um, also they go to the grandma's house, and that's where they're living after this because the insurance company won't pay them because their house is missing. It's not that's right destroyed, so they don't have enough money to buy another house, so they have to live with grandma. <sighs> and that's Classic. where Robbie goes. Woof, right here. Yeah, <laughs> I had to rewatch the discussion about the difference between poltergeist and haunting. That made zero sense. It doesn't make to any me. sense. No, <laughs> it doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. But it's like, uh, wait, what? It, what? Yeah. Uh, area mm-hmm. of bilocation and ionization flux. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because honestly, in this movie, I don't think I have ever actually tried to figure out what's going on and why. Like I can piece together enough to like get the general gist, but still, like, there's no reality or truth behind all the 
the it's explanation mis- of the paranormal phenomenon right. going on. Yeah, it's like ghosts love to stack those fucking chairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like and send a, a highly localized tornado at the house, <laughs> and and like, it means they want the girl. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and like and <laughs> the rule will be fucked up, but also yeah. they'll be back in it again. Like there's just yeah. it, it's there's, weird. It's, they're good at making diversions, but only when there are trees. Exactly. <laughs> there, it, if you drill down too deeply into the, like I. There is no bigger skeptic of the paranormal shit than me. <laughs> so, like, it's funny that I like this movie so much since mm-hmm. there's so much, like, like I'm putting quotes around this science that's, yeah. this, that's described <laughs> yeah. by these by these para, Parapsychologi- parapsychologists. Par- yes. yes. I also think, though, that all of what we just said kind of gives more credit to the movie because it doesn't matter. Like, if a movie is bad, yeah. you, that's when you want to focus on some of those things. Like, what was the... When evil lurks, I'm like, well, why is that? Why is that happening? Yeah, right. Because I didn't like the movie. But this one, I'm so enraptured with the movie and the things that's happening. I don't need to know why. Yeah. I'm not focused on why because I'm I like so much of the rest of it. Because you're swept up in the Jerry Goldsmith score. <laughs> oh, I am. It I am. is. It's fucking awesome. I said it earlier, and I, but I need to say it again. <laughs> Christopher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one, the director of When Evil Lurks, his first movie, does feature um, a little threesome of paranormal investigators. Like, mm. he uses that trope and um, terrified. But also in the <laughs> second Poltergeist movie, <laughs> they do tell you, like, supposedly why all of this is happening. Although I, they kind of retcon some of it. But it it makes it worse. It, it's like, a bad Yeah, really they do explain it, and it's way worse. It's, oh, it's, i got to see it. It's... <sighs> It's I think there are some things that you'll yeah. enjoy about it. Honestly, like there, there are some. They they had some money, and they had H.R. Giger help design some stuff in it. Oh, so I there's there's some that. really gross looking shit in it. That's really cool. The rest of the movie, you're gonna, you're you're just gonna get mad because like I think something that I always wanted from when I was a kid seeing this movie is I desperately wanted to see what it looked like where Carol Ann was. Well, you get to see it in the oh, second one, and yeah. it's not as good as you want it to oh. be. <laughs> Christopher, just watch it with like just clear eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just watch it. For, Remember for what it is. For fun. Remember that time when I used to have an open mind. Yeah. Way exactly. back when. Way Go back, back to that <laughs> point in time before you started reading about Reagan <laughs> in bed and smoking weed. Yeah, Christopher. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, this is an insane thing to say, but when I was little, I was super into like ghosts and paranormal, and I had all these like handbooks. And uh, from my understanding, I don't think this is a poltergeist because usually a poltergeist is like quote unquote attached to like it's usually like a um, like a pubescent girl, and it's like her energy is like so nuts that it's like affecting things in the house or the room or whatever. This is just ghosts haunting a girl. Like I don't. Well, eventually, I don't think this is a poltergeist. Well, it's the house is buried on the cemetery, and they didn't remove the bodies. So it's these are the ghosts, the beings that are trapped. Mm -hmm. Well, and we'll get into the like the the meat of the explanation of what's happening in the next section here when we meet the my second favorite character in this movie. Yes. Uh, Just saying, though, because of these handbooks, I thought that shit like this was, like, real. Because, yeah. of course, they, like, also, like, frame it like there's science behind it and, like, whatever those, like, electrical waves are. And you can, yeah. like, finding out that this shit is not real, I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what well, do you mean? <laughs> it's amazing how much shit gets blamed on electricity. <laughs> yeah. What I mean, how they need to find some way to explain it away. But I will say, this movie came out in 82. Ghostbusters came out two years later. So I feel like this movie was kind of setting you up and giving you some information that you could take along with you. So when you met the Ghostbusters, as these paranormal psychologists, like you, it all made it more real or more like it legitimized it for me as, you yeah. know an (laughs) eight-year-old same special effects team worked on both movies oh really yep that's why they both look so fucking cool all right we're ready to move on yes phase five all right steve has a conversation with his boss mr teague about a new housing project coming up as the two walk by a hillside cemetery teague tells steve that he can have a new house right there on that spot with a large bay window overlooking the valley Steve remarks that the house can't simply be built over a cemetery. Teague tells Steve that the company has moved whole cemeteries before. The coffins were dug up and moved, along with their headstones, to new locations nearby. 
Teague then reveals that much of Cuesta Verde was built on the location of one of these relocated cemeteries. Steve seems quite astonished at the news, stating, that's sacrilegious. When the parapsychologists return, they bring a spiritual medium, Tangina Behrens, played by Zelda Rubinstein, who uses her psychic sensitivity to ascertain facts about the disturbances. Tangina tells them that Carol Ann is alive and in this house. According to her, the spirits haunting the home have left this life but have not gone into the spectral light. They are stuck in between dimensions, watching their loved ones grow up, but feeling alone, causing them to feel sad and even angry. She says that because Carol Ann was born in this house, she has the strongest connection to it. She gives off her own very strong life force that is as bright as the spectral light, which confuses the spirits who think Carol Ann is their salvation. Hence, they have taken her. However, Tangina also warns everyone that a malevolent spirit also exists in this dimension. It likes that the spirits are confused and lost, and uses Carol Ann as a distraction so they cannot move on into the light. Tangina says, It lies to her and tells her things only a child can understand. To her, it is simply another child. To us, it is the beast. That's cool shit. That is cool. <laughs> Tangina is so good. She rocks. She walks in. She's sassy. If yeah. you don't mind hanging back, you're jamming my frequency. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> I can't even. I When I watched this a couple days ago for this, I were around that like five times because it's just my favorite. And she's got her hair scooped up and <laughs> she's just so confident. And you know, oh, she's going to get it done. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I couldn't help but when she comes on screen, she looks just like Rod Steiger from In the Heat of the Night with her glasses. I know. I'm sorry, but that's all I could think of. You get it. You get a fun and funny little dismissive line from Steve about what side of the rainbow are we working tonight? Is this your Knott's Berry Farm solution? Which, you know, I mean, again, I don't. We we have no sense of how long this shit has been going yes. on and how many things they've tried. So, like, yeah, of course, when this bewitching little woman comes into your house and she's whipping baseballs through the wormhole <laughs> yeah. and she tells you how many hearts your house has and you know and she but she also immediately is able to like tell where where the shit is so mm-hmm. you know there's, there's well, and, something to and it and she like cuts Steven down and because he plays that trick she goes up the stairs and he's oh, I thought she could read minds and blah 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 she goes I can but I don't like people playing tricks like she totally puts him in his place Fucking as a awesome. non-believer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, "Okay, okay. What do you got?" Yeah. I love that Steve's been telling his boss he has the flu for how many months? Yeah. <laughs> oh, did he actually say a time? I don't remember that. I don't remember, but it seems like it's been like Yeah. Because the boss even remarks that um Carol Ann's not been in school because he has some like niece or something who hmm. goes to school with her. Also I just got to watch it again. Like when they're yeah. talking after about, I watch two and three. When they're talking yeah. about the phase <laughs> five <two>. of <laughs> Quest of Verde, um, Steven also, says they all have the flu. Yeah. Steven has sold seventy million dollars of properties in that neighborhood. That's two hundred and twenty-eight million dollars in today's dollars. That's what is his commission? Yeah, yeah. A, an underground swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what Clark Griswold was going to build? Uh-huh. With he was. It yeah. was a thing, yeah. yeah. That was a sign. Every, they were expensive. It yeah. was a sign. Well, I think the whole movie is just so full of these references from that era. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the houses, this kind of California suburb, the station wagon. You know, the dawn of remote control, TV in the bedroom, child abduction. I mean, it's just chock full. Yeah. Plus mm-hmm. all the references in the beginning to the, uh, you know, there's the Atari 2600 that's right out on the table. All the Star Wars references. I mean, it's such of an era. Another reference sort of to Christmas Vacation is the Jelly of the Month Club because they're covered in jelly when they come through the portal. Ew! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Sorry, I, I somebody said yeah. Anyway, you said something about Christmas vacation, and it made me think of the disgusting ectoplasm. <laughs> but this movie is so nostalgic, though. It is. It is even for someone who didn't live during this time. It reminds me of like my childhood and like PBS or yeah. like yeah, I don't mm-hmm. know. It just has that very like neighborhood vibe. There's something idyllic about it. The way even like if you look at a movie like from the 90s, like Edward Scissorhands or something, where you get the sense of this subdivision, this neighborhood, these houses, this like you know perfect family value is kind of like taking a nod back to like the 1950s. Mm-hmm. 
you've got that vibe going on here, which yeah. also makes it so much more terrifying that there's this horrible presence that's disrupting. Yeah. Yep. I really like um, when he's talking to his boss. The boss is like, I didn't see Carol Ann. And Steve's like, she's around. <laughs> she <laughs> no. is. That's so she's, funny. Yeah, she is. She's in the TV. And she's blacking around somewhere. <laughs> Hanging out with the beast to build them with blocks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> She's trying to stay away from the beast. <laughs> it's going to bite her. <laughs> so they, they finally realize that the entrance to the other dimension is through the children's bedroom closet. Tangina tests the dimensional portal with a few tennis balls that drop through the living room ceiling below the kid's closet. By tying a rope around a live person who can enter and presumably exit the other side with enough time to grab Carol Ann, they could bring her back. Confusing. <laughs> Tangina intends to be the one to go into the light but Diane insists saying that Carol Ann will only come to her mother Diane goes into the portal and Tangina coaxes the agonized spirits away from Carol Ann to the real light while Tangina is in her trance like state telling the lost spirits to cross over into the light Steve panics and pulls on the rope like a fucking idiot <laughs> meeting the beast face to face Diane falls through the living room ceiling clutching Carol Ann and bearing new streaks of gray hair, presumably from fright. Diane and Carol Ann are also covered in ectoplasm. <laughs> <laughs> After Steve sort of revives both of them in the downstairs bathtub, Tangina pronounces that this house is clean. This is how When Evil Lurks starts. All of these cleaners who mm -hmm. uh, don't really get the job done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like to when... They're arguing because Tangina was going to go in, and Diane was, says, no, I'm going to go. And then Tangina says, you've never done this before. And she says, neither have you. And you're Tim, right. You go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so good. It's, she's just like, you're right. It's so good. And I also love Tangina when she is doing that transfer, and she was all children, all are welcome. That is creepy. Fuck yeah, it with is. With the whole room with all those lights happening, and she goes against the wall, and I'm like, is she giving up? Is she still helping? What is she doing? Yeah. So good. Yeah. There are there's a couple of things that happen related to the tennis ball that make me laugh. Number one, the first one when it comes through, the dude smells it. <laughs> Did you notice that? No. <laughs> and then when the second one comes through, he he just goes, kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Which I don't know why, but but both of those made me laugh a lot. It's like I'll be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the beast. Face the big face coming out of the closet looks cool looks as hell. Sweet, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I love all of the effects right here. Me too. Me too. All those they show a little bit of how they did all the lighting effects in the closet. It's just like it's like they had a series of like aquariums with smoke in them and stuff, like and strobe lights and and it understandably it was very disorienting to shoot in there. Oh, I oh bet. Like um, migraine city. Yeah. I was wondering about that because I don't think this is actually how they would have done it, but they have that like Pepper's Ghost kind of like uh, filmy quality. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was like, is it digital? I think it's way too early to be digital. Like, I don't quite understand. They but did they them look... in water tanks. So like, oh. like the, are you talking about like the, the beasts yeah, and stuff? And, like, the yeah. Ghosts so the fact that they have that like, like kind of shimmery quality to them, they're, they're, they filmed them in, wa in water. Gotcha. Yeah. It's cool as fuck. Super cool and such a unique look to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, I don't remember how big they actually are, but I mean, they're not, mm -hmm. they're not huge. Um, they just, but they just would make a little puppet, put it underwater, film it, backlight it. Industrial mm. light and magic, baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of miss the days when you had to figure out how to film something mm -hmm. to make it look really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Now, you know, you can just you just do it you on can a just computer. Do it, but it's like it's so it looks like same. a video game. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, there should be a pause on digital. And if you want to create something, you need to go back to 1982 and use the technology that existed. You know, wouldn't that be a cool challenge? Mm -hmm. Supposedly, that new Alien movie is mostly practical effects stuff. Mm -hmm. One can hope. It's like a lot of makeup and squibs and dummies, and I, I, I'm all for it. Pink ectoplasm. That's not so much a thing in the Alien franchise. That goo, though. that pink goo, is so gross. Yeah. <laughs> like when they come out of it, they're all wrapped up in that ball it's all all together. covering their eyes and shit. Yeah. And, and when that, he, actually, when you first see it, when the dude is pulling the rope down in the living mm -hmm. room and it's like getting all over his hands, it's really 
chunky. It's like yeah. chunky and it's like more like jello. It's apparently cool. apparently the, the stuff that you see falling into the sink when the dude's ripping his face off is jello. Is it? Like that actually is it's jello mixed with like um like chicken fat or something. Which, you know. Probably My a, dog would love that. Yeah. <laughs> My dog would, yeah, it my sounds like somebody's got the stomach flu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve, keep it down. Oh, I love Diane's gray streaks. They look so cool. Hell yeah. It's like a rogue in X-Men. Exactly. Or, yeah. And Bride of Frankenstein. Cool. It's Ooh. a shame that like she immediately is just like, well, I'm going to dye my hair. Like, yeah. she's reading she the does. directions. Yeah. In the second one, she's got all brown hair again. It looks dumb. And it's cut a little short and swoopy. Also, someone here says, I can smell that mimosa. So like oh, orange yeah. juice the or flower. what would it like what does orange juice and champagne have a smell the, like a particular I think it just smell? means they're feeling one coming on mimosa because they want to drink a mimosa a flower what yeah there's a there's a type really? of flower called mimosa I just yeah. thought they were looking forward to like moving and then being relaxed and waking up in the morning and having a mimosa together the no. mom and dad <laughs> <laughs> people the... also ask why is mimosa a problem <laughs> <laughs> well. It can be a problem. I guess in the southern states, it's invasive. Mm. The drink or the <laughs> <laughs> why is mimosa California <laughs> problem? <laughs> um, also, if I was these people, I wouldn't be leaving my kids in the house. I wouldn't be making dinner in the house. I wouldn't yeah. be taking a bath in the house. Like, yeah, we're leaving right now. Get in the truck. Stay in the truck. <laughs> well, with that in mind, the Freelings quickly pack their belongings to move the hell out of Cuesta Verde. On their final night in the house, Steve leaves Diane alone with the children so he can go and talk to Teague. While Robbie and Carol Ann are getting ready for bed, Robbie's clown doll comes to life and pulls him under the bed. Diane, relaxing in the primary bedroom, hears her son's screaming voice and tries to investigate, but is pulled against the wall and ceiling by an unseen force. Robbie manages to rip the clown doll to pieces as the portal in the closet begins to reopen disgustingly. Diane tries to help her son and daughter, but runs into the beast itself, seemingly, this time in the form of a snarling skeletal demon in the hallway. <laughs> just just door-sized now. <laughs> the box the bedroom door and lunges at her, causing her to fall backwards down the stairs, which was scary. I feel like she could get her legs caught in those in the railing. But yeah. that's that, anyway, I'm worried about you, Diane. <laughs> Diane then runs outside, screaming for help from her next-door neighbors, but slips into the freshly dug swimming pool. The previous rainstorms have filled the deep end, and as Diane tries to escape, coffins and corpses begin erupting from the earth, releasing skeletons into the pool. Her neighbors hear the commotion and arrive to help Diane out of the pool, but then they refuse to enter the house for obvious reasons. Diane runs back into the house, finds Carol Ann and Robbie, barely able to fight the energy that tries to suck them back into the portal. Diane manages to pull them to safety, and they escape. Coffins and corpses are now exploding out of the ground throughout the house and the yard. Absolute fucking chaos. Steve pulls up in his car with Teague, seeing the chaos and dead bodies. It is now obvious that Teague never relocated the cemetery. He simply built the housing development over the top of the graves and only moved the headstones. Steve is pissed. (laughs) (laughs) Dana arrives in her boyfriend's car and is upset over what she is seeing happening to the house. The Freelings pile into the station wagon and they drive off. The house sends out one more concussive blast, knocking Teague on his ass before it implodes and is sucked into the alternate dimension as the stunned neighbors look on. The weary Freelings check into a Holiday Inn for the night, and before the credits roll, Steve pushes the television set outside of their room. It's weird. This movie has two endings, kind of. Yes, I was just thinking that. And it's so good because... The, like, fake ending, I guess, like when they get Carol Ann back, that could reasonably be the end of this movie. Mm -hmm. It was scary enough. It, like, came to a head and Mm -hmm. resolved. Um, And you wouldn't necessarily need to know why it all happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? But having this, at like, cap at the end is so great because it's even more freaky than what we just saw. (laughs) The second scariest thing to me is a as a kid was the skeletons in the pool. And that was before oh. I learned all of the lore about like, oh, well, once again, Toby Hooper's people used real ones, which is 
what? Where do you get a real skeleton? Yeah, yeah. especially in that state of decomp. It's There's a like, lot of yeah. skeletons. That's not like a medical skeleton. No. It's a lot of so, skeletons. No wonder there was a curse. These were free. Oh, Toby's no. just digging out back. He's, yeah, yeah. I know where some good ones are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steven's directing. He's out there digging up skeletons for the next shot. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's gross. It's scary. Her reactions are awesome. Yeah. One really scary thing when Caroline and Robbie were in the bedroom was when the closet turns into that giant orange, like, dryer tube snake, like, throat to swallow yeah. them in. Yeah. That was really creepy after watching the mom bounce around the bedroom. And I was, the, oh my gosh, Jo Beth Williams did so much physical work. There are so many scenes back to back. Her in the hallway, her in the bedroom, her in the pool, her going back in the house. She is beaten. She was literally bleeding after going around that gimbal box. Yeah. So much physical work was, it was intense. She was phenomenal in this, like from beginning to end. Couldn't agree more. So I love the the jump scare with the clown. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I thought that was really well done and really clever. So, you know, we've all seen a hundred jump scares in yep. our, or more. You know, yeah, and I thought this was clever and new. Oh, it still least. works. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And this one wasn't like overridden with jump scares, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It, was, it, was, exactly. it was a good one. You only get a couple of like real good ones, and um, yeah, the the clown and the tree are apparently both things that Steven Spielberg were like childhood fears of his was like he had a tree in his backyard that he was afraid of when he would see it at night, and then he was also afraid of clowns. So like, effectively, Robbie is kind of. A vessel for Spielberg's fears in this, which I which I really like. But I don't understand. Like, Robbie was already afraid of the clown when he was sleeping earlier. Before any of this happened, he threw a, a, a coat over it to cover it up because he was afraid. Mm-hmm. After everything that happens in the movie, we've gotten to the end. Him and Caroline are going to go to bed. Mom's taking a bath, dyeing her hair. Why is the bedroom so put back together and the chair is in the same spot it's and the mis- clown is sitting on the chair? The, the clown I should know. be in a, if it's like a cherished clown, it should be in a box ready to be moved. Why is it still in the room? And why doesn't Robbie get rid of it? even bought it for him in the first place. But why, but why is it still on the <laughs> is chair? It, is it his is it, or is it hers? It's on his side of the room. It's on a chair at the foot of his bed and the chair is in the same spot again. For the movie, you've yeah. got to have it there. It makes sense. Right. But I'm also just like, yeah. burn that clown. Yeah, Leave get, it in the basement for the next tenant. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. They should. That'd be awesome. Put it in the closet. Toss it in the pool. <laughs> With all the other scary things. For the remake. Yeah. Because that's what happens in the it's remake. All the clown. They, they find the clown in the house. <laughs> the clown just walks oh, to Grandma's dumb. house. <laughs> I know that that movie's going to be dumb. I just know it. I can't bring myself to watch it because I like this movie too much. I think much. the clown is on the Pulter cover Grace of the too? DVD for that. It is. The, the no, Poltergeist 2015. The remake. The remake. Oh, the, yes. It's yeah. all over it. That sucks. Exactly. They took the one. Anyways, they focus on one little element that was, you know, mm-hmm. cute here, but... Hey, anyways. let's take this classic movie that everyone likes and make it worse. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. We've already met Pennywise, y'all. I do like that we get, um, when Steven comes back, why he had to go to work at night, who knows, but he comes back from the office with Teague, and Teague is just, like, beside himself watching all of this happen, and Steven sees his house is just, like, flashing lights. <laughs> I love the fact that Teague just stands in the the, the street watching all of this happen mm-hmm. as Steven and his family, and eventually Dana comes home. She hops in the car, <laughs> fresh hickey on her neck after whatever she was doing on her date. And then I love they just get in the car and fly away. And yeah. then Teague is still standing in mm-hmm. the middle of the street <laughs> watching all of this chaos, like, yeah. literally unfold in front of his eyes. I just think that was so good. Oh, I yeah. love that Steve comes back with his boss, and his house is, like, a hundred percent nuts. His wife is like, Steven, help us! <laughs> and he still takes the time to cuss out his boss real quick. Yeah. You son of Damn a bitch. Damn straight. <laughs> and the yeah. way he says, why? Why? Yeah. At the end, that is the craziest line reading I've ever heard in my life. It's awesome. It's it's applicable. So how did it get in all of our heads that it was an ancient Indian burial That's ground. part two. Uh, it's part two. It's I, like a... But I. It's the funny thing is I never saw part two. Yeah. It somehow permeated everyone's idea of pop culture, right? I think Stephen King has a lot to do with it because that's like such a thing in a lot oh. of his... Like, like pet cemetery? Pet cemetery. Just, yeah, and like... It's I, a big trope in well, you general. Know, when Lauren and I watched this, we realized that we both had the same experience of like without even seeing the second one, 
we were just under the impression that it was related to that. And I think there might be there there is a line, I think, when they're looking over the next development where they're like, Well, it's not some ancient burial ground. Like they they mm-hmm. the guy says that it's not, but somehow it gets in your head that it is. Right. I don't really know why that is. Wait but, till you guys see the second movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> The only other things I wanted to say about this last chunk is, um, yeah, that portal in the closet, the new version of it, the, like, mouth or throat or whatever it is, looks very cool. And you do get, like, the only little bit of making of stuff that you get in that seven-minute featurette, they show it on the set, on the Universal lot. And so you get a glimpse of, like, how it all works. And it was it was uh, actual size, too, which is super cool. Wow, that's wow. Um, that is really cool. Yeah. One other note I have is that when the family is in their station wagon driving away and the house is imploding and the boss guy is watching, Robbie's looking back and he's, the kids, everyone's terrified at this point. And Robbie's freaking out and he yells, the house is coming. <laughs> I thought that was such a good line yeah. and a kid reaction. The house is coming. Yeah. Because yeah. they were trying to get away so fiercely. And I also love that when they're driving away and the music is starting, there's that sign. You are now leaving Cuesta Verde. We will miss you. Mm-hmm. Yep. That was a good shot to include for sure. Do you guys know how they did the house implosion? No. At the very end? It's super cool. So I have a I have a fun story that I pulled up about it. It's pretty it's quick. So the actual house used for filming was closely studied and over several weeks an identical miniature was constructed even the interiors were accurately reproduced down to the furniture within measuring six feet wide and four feet high the model created solely for the purpose of being destroyed cost about twenty five thousand dollars so the miniature was constructed to break up quickly and on cue Concealed cables built into the model were attached to the furniture and window frames, and when pulled, would draw them towards a large black funnel where a powerful vacuum would ingest all of the debris. So essentially, they filmed it from above, like it, like at the front of the house is facing up, and they're pulling it into a vacuum, and then they're blasting it with a shotgun <laughs> so it would pull apart. And they shot it in like a super high frame rate, like I think 360, uh, 360 frames per second. So, That's like, amazing. Yeah, so it's like, and so the resulting thing that you end up with, and they only did it once because they only had one shot at it, was just this pile of debris. And so they boxed it up into this this cube, and this cube with all the debris sits on, uh, Spielberg has a piano at his offices, at um, the Amblin offices on the Universal lot, and it's just sitting on there. Wow. Wow. So That's it's, really cool. It's very cool. Um, Man, talk about... Filmmaking. Can you put a pause on digital? Have people do that. I wish I was That'd smart be very enough to think of how to, to do that. Shit. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's yeah, two, you couldn't really two shotguns, which is <laughs> yeah. pretty funny. Steve <laughs> Spielberg's not... hands on the shotgun. Yeah. He's got, yeah. I got one yeah. take, guys. Got one he's, take. Like, he's peeling off your face, apart. <laughs> and then just like vacuuming it. It's, that's yeah. so yeah. interesting. Like yeah. the, the creative things that needed to be done. Yep. Could Geniuses. you imagine though know, screwing up that take? Like oh, I forgot to hit record yeah right. or, the lens cap's still on right Fuck. oh my god i, I mean, missed <laughs> i didn't shoot the house i shot the other guy it's the poltergeist PG. curse exactly exactly <laughs> oh my god wow yeah. that's oh i'm glad to hear that story matt and that's cool to know that the the box still exists i'm gonna look that up apparently it still exists yeah it's very cool that's a fun fact for very sure cool I was also impressed by Diane in that rotating room, and that it came out before Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm-hmm. That's wild. It mm-hmm. came out two years before. Mm-hmm. Yep. Giving Wes some ideas here. Yep. Yeah, there were so many shots in this where even the simple ones, I wondered how they did it. Like when uh, when the mom turns her back and looks back and all the chairs are stacked. I watched that several times. It's so flawlessly cut. There's or, a little cut in there, yeah. Oh, and it, it's did you see it? Teeny tiny. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's just yeah. I'm I'm like I'm almost positive uh, that's how they did it. Because oh. I I yeah. looked I, for it. I yeah. assumed it was just a bunch of guys. <laughs> I mean, I, I like that better. I like they have like okay, quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And wear you know wear your yeah. s- your soft shoes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> actually, I wouldn't put it past them that that's how they did it. But I I don't know. I don't know for sure. But I'm almost positive but, I could pull up the movie right now and we could check it. Yeah, but, but the the fact that we don't know exactly how they did it, yeah. I mean, that's awesome, too. Yeah, With I mean... Suspension of belief. You're watching a movie. It's yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. 
The dolly zoom down the hallway is also very cool. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Yes. And I love, at one point she yells, help me, somebody! Mm -hmm. That's me every day, dude. Just <laughs> like, <laughs> could someone get in here and She is this? frantic, but I love that she is in such, like, mo a mother saving her children mode. She is tired of this. They have already been through hell and back, mm -hmm. and now they're back in it, and she gets them out of the bedroom, and then, I don't know how she does that, she, like, has her feet on the outside of the door frame. Yeah. That's so wild. She gets them. That's that, like, mom adrenaline. Like, yeah, exactly. seriously, car. seriously. She's in go mode. Oh, my God. And r poor Robbie. She's like, grab your sister! Yeah. yeah. No Ooh. pressure. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure, Robbie. Use your kid's strength. <laughs> <laughs> well, he already fought a tree. He fought yeah. a clown twice. <laughs> And I love that the, the caskets just start shooting out of everywhere now. Everywhere. Pff, right out of the ground. Six everywhere feet they're up. trying to go. <laughs> yeah. There's just a like casket blasts up out of the ground. <laughs> oh. See, doesn't it feel a little bit like Raiders or, I, you know, or any of the other yeah, Indiana Jones? Totally. And I love that, oh, well, you know, about it. It really has that Spielberg imprint all over it. It does. And it's I, I think that there's a lot of overlap with a lot of the crew and a lot of the, the effects people and stuff. So it's, I that's mm -hmm. again, that's part of why it feels so... That's why it feels so much like it is a, a Spielberg movie, but there is something different and like a little bit rougher about it which mm -hmm. would which is what makes me think well no this was directed by toby hooper who like mm -hmm. i like to i like some of toby hooper's movies but he's not spielberg mm -hmm. you know but i'm still so curious about that double hat matt i me too <laughs> i'm looking that up I, if i ever get to meet spielberg it's the only thing i'm gonna ask him about <laughs> yeah. is his the two-sided hat mm -hmm. and then he'll say get out of my face. <laughs> like, I, wrote a letter, I wrote a letter to Toby Hooper. How it's did all you settled. get in here? <laughs> or he might say, well, since it means so much to you, here you go. And then yeah. he puts it on me. Yeah. And then, he, <laughs> and then he bonks my nose and sends me on my way. He won't explain it. He just gives you the hat. Yeah. Well, I was, it's right behind your ear. <laughs> I was surprised to see that this movie um, was nominated for three Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. I don't know the third one, but two I have were visual effects and original score mm -hmm. and it lost both to et mm. i don't know what the third one was or what else won in its place yeah, but those two they I lost certainly. john williams won for et instead of goldsmith for this one well all three of these kids are traumatized for life oh and everybody is Every, like everybody in that house would be i would assume yeah that was a fucked up couple of months or however long it was supposed to be now i'm curious and i want to i know go back to that line with t because i wasn't really paying attention to everything that he was saying i don't like i am not confident that it has been months but it, that's sure. just like my impression yeah mm -hmm. well too if you think back to the scene where steven is first meeting with the paranormal psychologists and he looks totally dis disheveled. And then when they go back to their own house and they're showing them everything, they seem yeah. perfectly at, at ease, not at ease and happy about it, but like mm -hmm. understanding or knowing what's happening. Yeah. But I can't imagine them just like chilling in their house for that long without getting help. Right. Well, they specifically say they don't go to the police, so. Right. What are they going to do? Shoot it? <laughs> 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 Got to shoot the closet. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was Poltergeist. Um, any kind of final thoughts before we get into our uh, convoluted ranking scale? <laughs> All right. So I adore this movie. Watching it as a young person, it stood out. It was an awesome movie. We watched it a ton as a kid. I've watched it so many times throughout my lifetime. I revisit every couple of years just to watch it because it's just, it has so many good things about it. And for me, like a kid in the 80s, so much nostalgia. I... Steven Spielberg, amazing. His involvement, just the the look, the feel, the sound, all of the things. I can't think of anything bad to say about it. Um, I give the movie 9 out of 10 for overall rating. And then on the scare meter, this one I always kind of juggle with. Like, was it scary to me? Is it scary to the world? Was it scary when I first watched it? Um, I don't... It, I think it is scary. I think it is spooky. And I'm going to... I'll give it a 2 out of 5 on the old scare o meter I can go next. So uh, there's so much to love here, and I loved our discussion today. Uh, I loved all the Spielberg feel of this movie and the special effects. I love the fact that someone's daughter is gone and missing, but yet there's still somewhere in the house, and you can barely communicate with her. So that's pretty creepy and pretty pretty dark. Uh, I violated Matt's 
first law of watching movies when I watched this most recently, which is don't watch this movie in a bad mood. Ah. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, did it make your mood better? Uh, it made me like the movie less because I was in a really bad mood <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> watching this. So I think that kind of colored my impression this time. I'm going to give it a high seven. Um, I think it doesn't have a lot of nostalgia for me, even though the movie should. There are so many scenes from another era but it just doesn't quite uh, doesn't quite make me think of my own childhood for some reason. It should, but it didn't quite do that. And I'm going to give it a one on the horror scale. The scarometer. The scar. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Official yeah. name. The scarometer. Right. Uh, I was thinking back to last episode when I invented my. <laughs> That was a one time meter. <laughs> this is the scare meter, right? Oh, I love this movie. I've loved it for a long time. Actually, when we first started the podcast, this was on my short list as well because I just think it's a really solid movie. I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. I don't care. I love this movie. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. Fight me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody at this table is going to fight you about that. <laughs> Um, and then Scarometer, I'll give it a two out of five. A lot of it isn't that scary to me, and I don't think it's supposed to be like the world's most scary movie ever. But um, a lot of what scares me is like the kids being in danger. And mm -hmm. like when I watched it as a kid, I put myself in the shoes of the kids. Now I put myself in um, Joe Beth's. Is that what's Joe Beth Williams? Joe Beth Williams, yeah. Actress. Yeah, in her shoes, in Diane's shoes. That's more terrifying to me because you got three kids two arms 55 ghosts a beast like it's just it's too much you know so yeah two out of five just because some parts of it are pretty freaky mm -hmm. well it as is the case with everything I've picked, I love this movie. <laughs> Fight me. I don't understand the assignment. I, I thought this was Pick Your Favorite Movies podcast. So I do that. And, uh, yeah, I love this movie. This is a 10 out of 10 movie for me. Um, it is. It has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. Every time I watch it, I enjoy it just as much as I did the first time. Um, and, it's you know, the other thing is I try to pick movies for this podcast that that did at one point really scare me not necessarily ones that do scare me now this movie scared the shit out of me when i was a kid mm -hmm. because i was watching it through the eyes of robbie essentially mm -hmm. where like i wasn't even so much scared of the clown but the idea like you had said the idea of this like your sister is this is like missing in your own home and you don't know where she is but you also know she's in danger and you can't see that danger Except at a couple... Well, actually, Robbie doesn't see it. The dad sees it. Anyway, you don't... It's it's the same thing that makes a lot of alien work. You're imagining what the scary mm -hmm. thing is. And, like, that. that's just damn good filmmaking. Um, this movie has a lot of technical issues, but I don't care. I love all of it. And I... Note, Matt does not care. I don't. I don't Nobody cares this episode. For once. Okay. No, we, we don't give a shit this episode. <laughs> Except we really do. Except we definitely do, because I love this movie a lot, and I spent a bunch of time on the notes. For Scarometer, with with the, like, the face ripping thing and the beast coming out of the closet, the when the closet turns into a weird, gross, orange throat, like, all that shit's pretty scary i i'm gonna say three out of five for the scare meter for me and when i was a kid it would have been a fucking six out of five <laughs> yeah um because yeah <laughs> skeletons Woo. but anyway yeah. yeah i love this movie it sounds like we all did and i'm i'm happy we all got to watch it and talk about it together and uh if you like what you've heard today you can email us and let us know at what scares us at aadl.org this has been What Scares Us. 